we've just done the painting in acrylics of the horse and the waves. Now I'm going to do one, more for fun than anything of course, uh, of the horse and the waves, but in watercolour this time. And we're going to start in the reverse. Last time I showed you how to tint the frame up. This time I'm going to start with the frame, which is an existing one with a glass already, and I'm going to cut the paper in the mount to fit the size. Here's our paper of the backing the board for the frame. It's not a very expensive frame, but it's got glass in it and it'll do for the job. So now I've got to cut two pieces of card the same size as that backing board. And then I'm going to give it a three and a quarter inch mount. So first of all, um, I'm just cutting this card two pieces to the right side. And in this case it's 2030, which in some ways is a bit of a shame because I've got canvas of that size. But anyway, we said do water colours, so that's what we do. So this is cutting the, the size of the card, first of all. Remember to keep a piece of card underneath the, uh, the mount cutter as you do it, otherwise you'll get a tatty edge. There's one piece, 2030. Now I want a darker edge to go inside. Right, we've cut the pieces to size, and now I'm cutting the three and a quarter inch mount. This was a, it was a three and a half inch internal, but this is the second piece, so it's got to be slightly smaller. So this is going to be three and a quarter because it's the outside mount. And I'll set it up, and I'll just run the cutter to the end. Place the blade in, bring it down. Always remember to put your card in upside down because these cutters cut at 45 degrees in reverse. Make sure it fits into there exactly. Get it nice and square, otherwise you won't have a decent mount. Again, the same thing again. Press it in, put it down. And if we've got everything set up right, we put two of the measurements just a fraction over. A third measurement of the width is exact. Two of the measurements will be just a fraction over. And that will mean that the cut will be just that little bit larger and the piece should drop out without any catches in the corner. And see in a moment, we? There we go. Get it right up into the corner, into the edges. Again, this is a 20-30 mount. That becomes the piece that drops out as easy as that. That's beautiful. And then we take the other mount, a light over a dark watercolour. And that should give me a nice quarter inch Border. There we are. So now I've got to cut the paper to fit that, so actually we're working in reverse. Just mark into the corners of this mat onto the edge of the paper, and that will give me a nice border to tape down and stretch. So I need to cut just these pieces off here to be fine. I can do that with the mount because while I'm at it, just slip it under here. I haven't got to be exact as long as I leave enough space. against the edges and just cut along. That'll be plenty. And there we go, got about 20 30 paper ready. And that's it. I'm just going to stretch this and we're ready to paint. Right, well there's our mount, fits within there, this needs gluing down there onto itself and this paper needs stretching. We've checked, looking through a uh, window, we've checked the watermark here. Sanders Waterford, that way up, so that's the surface of the paper. We know that's the way you need to stretch. We need to run a little line of EVA glue around the inside edge of this, just to stick the two halves of the mount together. And the mount can on top. And we'll just flip it over to make sure that it is exact the other side. There's just that little bit of play in the frame, so it's worth double checking on things like this when you do them. Yeah, that's nice. That's ready. It's time to uh, stretch the paper on here. I'd like to work on stretch paper this time. But the trick with stretching the paper is, first of all, start with dry hands. If you touch the gum paper at the edges and your hands are wet, you ruin the whole block. So we cut a tear, two pieces, just over the width. And Two pieces just over the length. And then we put the tape out of the way. So you can see the nice big cockle in the paper that's going to stretch out later. Here's our piece of backing board for the frame. Just put that in temporarily. And there's the mountain frame ready for use. The next stage is to start putting masking fluid onto here. I like this blue Pabio or grey Pabio drawing gun <clears throat> because I can see where it goes afterwards. And they've got to go into all of these lighter areas of the sea 
not just the white surf but any of these light patterns which I'll then tint back afterwards when I've removed it. I tend to use this clay shaper. This particular one's quite nice because it has uh, a pointed side and a, and a rounded and flat. So first of all I'm going to put the drawing gum on to all of these lighter areas. As you see, because it's this slightly blue-grey colour, you can see it afterwards which is very useful. A lot of work, but you know, that's the only way we're going to put the lights on without putting on um, either gouache or a light coloured opaque paint. If we want the translucency of watercolour, then our only way is to do it this way. So you see I can do quite large areas with that side of the, um, of the tool, or I can do finer ones by using the more pointed side of the tool. Right, I think we've just about done all the masking fluid that needed doing. Bits here and there, just to finish off. And now that's ready for painting over once it's dry. Okay, we've set up the paints now, and you can see the masking fluid on the paper behind is dried off. But let's look at the brushes we're going to use. Here's the kind of set I use for acrylics and oils. You see, I use long handled, and I prefer filberts for most of the work I do. That's a filbert with a rounded edge, flat this way and rounded that way. This gives me a lot more control from painting finer edges on surfaces or being able to go around rounder edges as well. And within that, I also have so I've got a whole series of those of different sizes, and then I have long handled, round, pointed brushes. These brushes are nylons and they're neither soft nor hard, they're just nice in between because when we put them on, if they're too stiff they tend to drag the paint off and mix it so well that it can blend too easily and if they're too soft they clog up. So there we are, the rounds and the filberts. Um, I also keep in a long rigger, in other words brushes which have a long pointed end and will paint long fine lines. They're painting rigging originally and certain textural brushes that are very useful for doing textural effects like moss and so on with that one and even this beautiful brush recently which you see has a, has a serrated end look beautiful for painting grasses and trees and so on then I've got a fan brush which is also very useful for special effects and painting trees and blending out and that just about does me for most of the work I do in acrylics and oils I keep a bit of sponge, sea sponge as well for textures now, that's quite different to the watercolour brushes. Although I have some different watercolour brushes, you can see I have a lot more brushes and so on for watercolour than I have for the oils and the acrylics. I've got these sword brushes, which are a beautiful shape. You can see they have a sword end here, um, and they're fine that way, and then with a sword edge that's sharper that way than this way, with this distinctive sword shape. I like a fairly long sword brush. Some of them are too sharp and short. But with these, they're great for figure painting, and they've got more you've got more versatility of movement. So those are swords, and I've got those in different sizes. Then we have the ordinary round brushes, and then we have the different sizes. I have riggers, that's this long one here. If I wet it you can see you can make a wonderful long point with it, and that would be good for painting long fine lines. It holds a lot of liquid. Again I've got various textural brushes such as these. Very useful for painting um, grasses, branches, twigs, uh, trees in winter, and I've got different sizes of those. I've got my hake brushes, such as this, which are great for doing big washes and very loose work. And one of my most useful brushes of all is the oval mop. That's this one, which is lovely when wet, because you've got it nice and flat one way to do lovely washes and you can go fine the other way. So between that and a fine brush like a rigger, I can almost do a painting with that alone or a hake and a rigger, just, just on, on their own. We've got the flat brushes, which are great for doing dry brush work, or paths or square windows and so on, so different sizes there. And that's about all I need, is just a variety of those types of brushes, but all of them will have a use. I use China Graph pencils, that's these especially scenes like uh, winter scenes where I can just peel away the paper here, peel away the tape and I, out in the field it's great because I don't have to have a pencil sharpener then and there's my lead immediately ready to go. They're very waxy, they're great for doing darker and finer lines for winter work. There's my profi pens in here for doing fine line work as in pen and ink so you get different thicknesses of nibs of those. They're waterproof, so you can do the pen and ink work first and the watercolour afterwards. Sponges for textural effects again. Uh, a little tube of white gouache for putting white highlights back in if I need. Or of course I can use pastels for that same effect as well. 
And then as I've just been using on here, I have these clay shapers with rubber tips, which are great for applying the masking fluid because they rub off easily and don't clog up like a brush would. So there's my basics. But having said that, all I'm going to need for this painting is just this one oval mop and maybe I shall use a little fine round brush for doing some of the final detail. So just one Pro Art oval uh, wash mop and that's all I'm going to require. I've already damped the paint slightly, ready to go. I always use artist watercolours, you mustn't use students, it's one thing that's not a saving. You can use students acrylics and oils and so on and get away with it. But with watercolours it is vital that we use only artist quality because they're finer, they go further, they're more transparent. The quality is so much better, it's not a saving using uh, cheap watercolours. Down with the pan colours in a way, they are um, just watercolour that's been squeezed out from tubes into this special palette so I can see what I've got and where, where I want it. And before we start, we need to just dampen the surface of those and they'll go back to their liquid state on the surface, which means I don't have to scrub at them with my brush to get them to work. Now we've just been talking about brushes and when talking about the brushes, um, I was saying that some were softer than others. This oval mop we're about to use is a very soft brush, so it'll put washes well into the paper, it'll cover all the surface of the paper, whereas a slightly stiffer brush would only go over the surface more, and that would be great for a technique called dry brush work. Having talked about the thickness and stiffness of brushes and the shape of them, we must talk about the paper. I'm going to use a 140 pound Waterford paper here, which is a knot. There are three types of paper. Hot press, which is the smooth one, knot, which is not either, and then the rough, which is the roughest surface texture. And they come in various weights. 140 is a good medium weight paper. 300 pound would be almost like card. But we needed to stretch this thinner paper for these washes that we're going to do so that they kept straight at the end of the painting and didn't cockle up. As you can see, the masking fluid already on there. It's well dried out in all of the white or lighter areas that I'm going to use. In watercolour we like to use transparent colour all of the time, so we hardly ever use gouache or uh, an opaque paint over the top. This will leave, when I rub off these areas of masking fluid, which are basically latex, it will leave the white paper showing cleaner underneath at the very end of the painting when I put all of the coats on. We need to start with the sky in this case, and I'm going to um, work up the sky, first of all, here. Uh, so I've already damped these colours down a little because these are just like the pan colours in a way. They are um, just watercolour that's been squeezed out from tubes into this special palette so I can see what I've got and where, where I want it. And before we start we need to just dampen the surface of those and they'll go back to their liquid state on the surface. Which means I don't have to scrub at them with my brush to get them to work. First of all then I want to go uh, onto the sky here and that's the lightest colours first. In watercolour we work from lights to darks. So I've drawn all of this out. I know that's going to work within the mount. I've put some very light lines there so I've got to paint just outside of those marks. And I know my whites are all pre-done. So my lightest colours first. Next, what should we start with then? I want a very slight um, raw sienna tint. So a little bit of this raw sienna to come in here into the clouds. Which ought to be a little bit pinker as well. And I'm going to paint wet next to wet and wet into wet. So I'm putting on these light colours just where I want them at first here. And remember that watercolour dries lighter than when you put it on. So although this may seem quite strong now, it's going to be very light shortly. Make a bit of that now, a little bit of rose I want. Come into the sky up here. Look for the colours, really look for the colours, let that blend in. I've got the paper at a very slight angle. A new slight angle, so that the paint, the paint will drop down a bit. And I don't want any hard edges. I want to work on this so quickly that these don't have a chance to dry. It is a very dry day, in fact, so I'm going to have to work even quicker than I thought. So I'm going to put a bit of water onto here now. It's drying already, because today is so warm and so dry. I'm just going to put water all the way along that horizon line. I don't want to go below the horizon line. I want to keep soft edges, so I've deliberately now... Normally I could get away with painting wet next to wet. But today is just so dry, the humidity is so, uh, so dry today that I'm going to have to wet the paper a bit and keep it going. So, as we go along, now watercolour is something that I can teach you the step by step, but you're only going to get to understand watercolour really by doing it yourself and experimenting and exploring. Now I want to go to a turquoise, I've got a beautiful turquoise here, and I want to use just a little touch of that, and we'll let that spread down into here. 
and we'll let gravity do some of the work. You see that lovely effect we're getting now? And as I say about experience, experience will, will also tell with you uh, in that how much water you put with the paint and how uh, much paint you put on as to how far it will actually spread. Just tickling in with the brush, look, this beautiful turquoise that I bought recently. It's a lovely colour. It's much brighter than cerulean blue, which I do like, but this turquoise even beats that. It's a lovely colour, isn't it? Now, having got that effect of the clouds all nice and fluffy, you can see them rising up here and it blending in softly. Let's go to a slightly stronger blue. Let's go to our cobalt blue now, and we're coming above that. So cobalt blue, and I'm going to come in above that now. Just leaving little bits of clouds showing here and there. Wet into wet, all the way through down here. So cobalt blue now, which is one of our intermediate blues. Let it come down into there. And make that blue a little bit stronger, so a bit more pigment higher up. Just splattered a fraction there. So I'm making the, the paint a little bit heavier now, up higher. And if I wanted to go warmer still, I could drop some ultramarine in. Right, there we are. Now I want a little bit more of that deeper blue coming just down to the clouds and under the edges of these clouds here, just a little bit. So we've got this lovely mixture of the blues coming through. You can see how that's spreading down. Down here it's slightly greyer. So I'm going to take that same ultramarine blue, sorry, that same cobalt blue, and add a little bit of the rose to it. And it'll give me a slight mauvey tint for down here at the horizon. So I'm going to go all the way along that horizon again. Nice and level with the horizon line, all the way along there. And because the paper's facing downwards, that will not blend in so much. All I'm going to do is just flick it upwards a little bit here and there, just to just link it into these clouds. It's a little bit of grey coming up into the clouds slightly, so it's not quite so hard edged down there. And that is going to give us a very light sky. We've got those lovely colours look. A little bit of greys around up here, we'll just join this in a bit more here. And there we are. If I wanted to go a bit darker, I could do a little bit more... Um, I could take a little bit of ultramarine and just go along here. And just let, just let the ultramarine come in a bit. Because the ultramarine is a little bit stronger blue and it'll just give us a bit more light as we come down. So I'm going to drop in some ultramarine just along the top edge here because it's a much stronger warmer blue it'll make these cooler blues down below seem even cooler still and we get this lovely effect there we are look just dropping it in a little bit making these cloudy effects effects of light i'm going to drop that in as well just coming down into the the clouds here a fraction especially around this bit here it's a bit darker Again, you can see the sort of effect we get up into a slightly harder edge cloud there. Because the paint's drying there a bit now, I can come in here and just drop in these striations of fraction. Some slightly harder edges around one or two of the clouds there. There we are. That will do for our sky, so we'll leave that alone now. Now, if we start painting here, it'll blend one into another, so we don't want to do that yet. But we do want to start getting some washes in. I want to get these very light blue areas around here started off now. And what's it going to be doing? It's going to be reflecting the light above. Now, there's a lovely colour called cobalt violet. That's this one here. Um, and I want some of that coming into here. Look at that beautiful colour. It's again starting with our light colours. So I'm going to put some of that cobalt violet. It comes all the way through here down into here, down that bit, and down there we've got that beautiful turquoise again coming in, so I'll go back to my turquoise now. I would have had to use um, cerulean in the past, but I do like this turquoise and I'm going to use quite a bit of it for this particular painting. Now it's dropping downwards so it's not going to, or hopefully isn't going to spread upwards into the painting, into the sky. It's dry enough now just that I can bring it down and into here and I can link those colours together just a bit, look. Again, I want that turquoise over in the distance here, reflecting the sky there. 
And I can bring that turquoise right through because I'm going to put warmer, darker colours later over here. Let that come down and all the way through there. So one glaze of it right through, pulling the colours together. I want those colours to link one into another, wet into wet. I mustn't let that go dry. And down with my turquoise, right down here. Beautiful colours we can get. Quite different to using acrylics or oils as we've just been doing. This is the, the second painting then in the series to show you how differently we can use a different medium and process technique for doing the same subject. You see what happens when you mix those together there, look? A little bit heavier here, a bit darker over here, and put some more of that deeper blue into there in a moment. Still coming through here with the the turquoise right down through to this edge and there's some of the turquoise coming into here it's reflecting down through here and so is that cobalt violet which I want to bring into here now as well so I'm going to start blending in this cobalt violet into here as well so we get these effects of these ripples coming through Nice big brush, keep it going, keep it wet. Get these lovely effects of wet into wet. Put it on and leave it alone. You can't mess about with things like this. <coughs> You've got to put it on freshly and just let it do its thing. We call that controlled accident. So we're letting the accidental effects happen under some control. Right the way through. And while my paper's still wet because it's very warm in this room today, put some more of that turquoise in and round and down here. Don't need to worry about any of the whites because all of those nasty mucky grey areas hopefully are going to rub off shortly even though it's been so hot in this room. And that is a problem. The masking fluid can tend to soak into uh, and stick onto the paper a bit. Um, it's a bit of a nuisance at times because if it's very hot in a room it melts it even further. Right, now I've got to come back to my cobalt blue and I want to come up here and start to drop some of that colour just into here to start to get this different feel of the warmer blue up there. And we'll let the accidental effects happen again of the paint spreading out I'll have to put a sharper edge on there when it's dry, so I'm waiting for that to dry off more now before I go back into that. And there's our slightly stronger, more cobalt blue. All the way along there. And slightly into here now, we can come back down into here too a little bit. Right through there, quite strong through here. And we can blend it in and we can even lift it out if we want. So I can go back into that and use my brush to soften the edge and lift it out, a damp brush. warmer blue and a little bit, a little bit of um, ultramarine coming down into here because I want it to be a bit warmer down this side. Let's bring it downwards as well to get the reflections. People always want to paint reflections as a, as a horizontal, they're not. The depth of the colour is in the, the vertical. Bring that along there, just touching some more of the blue into here in places. And this slight line here, a soft line of the, the waves and the ripples coming out from there. So 
find it reflections going a bit more here again. And these deeper blues, we'll just have a little bit of them now coming in here. These ripples just starting to show as they come through. And whilst the paint's still wet, these are going to spread out and soften out, which is what we want. And I want to put a little bit more purple into that, so I'm going to take a little bit of the ultramarine and the rose. To actually make a purple, we'll, we'll do it that way, we don't need a very deep purple in this. And that will give me that slightly warmer colour here and up here as well. Spreading more than I thought it would there, I don't want it to spread any further than that. Little bits of the purple coming down to there, to here. And we're ready to let that dry off a bit. I'm going to start putting some warms into here in a moment. Dry my brush off and just lift out some of this edge here make it a little bit drier and sharper don't want it spreading up into there I can come back over that with the glaze later but I just want to get it softened down a bit now Look at that bit of cloud meets there in the distance now we'll let that dry off there so it'll be a bit harder later here I want to start some of my warms, so I'm going to come down now to some raw sienna. The beauty of raw sienna is that it's more transparent than yellow ochre. I've got to go very warm down into here in a minute. So let's take some of that paint, and not too thinly, I'm using it fairly thickly, bring in these ripples, the effects of the ripples. Letting little bits of the lighter colour underneath shine through ripple effects. That's happening along here as well. And you want a colour on your brush, if you see it elsewhere, put it in. Make it a little bit stronger still with a little bit of cadmium orange, really plonk in some colour into there but let it go in nice and wet. Now back to my raw sienna, right through here. And that might look warm now but we're going to go even warmer in just a moment. And there we go. Just let that blend out into that area of lovely light. Little tiny strokes. Now I can use just the one brush by using it more lightly or just the tip of it to make this effect of these little ripples coming in. The incoming tide. Using it tightly dry brush over the surface there. And we've got that same colour in the background over here. So you see you can paint it over the blue quite nicely. 
comes it right in up to there. In fact, that's slightly stronger. I'm going to use a little bit of the cerulean blue now. You see the difference in those two colours there, the cerulean and the turquoise. I'm going to make that a little bit more, a little bit darker with the cerulean and the turquoise. So we get the difference in the reflections there. Gradually letting it fade in and as the paint dries we'll get harder edges as I carry on painting here. Right, I'm now ready to start my darker colour. I need to come up to some burnt sienna now and drop that into here. And these lovely darks. I'm going to go quite a bit stronger now. Letting the colours just glow in ripples in between. With these lovely light ripples. Don't leave too much because um, I've got the white already in there, remember, I've already done that with those masking fluids, so I don't have to leave too much of the light colours. Just odd little ripples here and there. Painting next to my masking fluid so I know where my lights and darks are. There we go. Back down here again with these lovely warms. Really want to hit these these beautiful warm colours. into that yellow ochre as well. So I'll just drop that in there while it's still wet. Now I'm actually going to take some purple because I do actually now want to drop some purple in. Purple and a little touch of Prussian, just to go a bit darker down here. Not too much water in it. It's quite dark in places down here. These lighter areas of masking fluid are. We're really going to come in there. And it looks a bit of a wet mismatch at the moment. But hopefully this is going to make sense when we remove the masking fluid because the lights will then, this will be sh there's a shadow underneath those lights. Just feeling the surface of the water. And it's darker along there. And here, got a little bit of darker. It's now much drier here, so I can start to paint some of these darker waves in the background. again just come in to the wave areas here I could come with a very fine brush, but I'm just trying to get away with using this brush. 
on nearly all of it to get these effects of these. Now the, see the paper is now drier and I'm able to do these harder edges of the paint and where it's still wet it will still spread out a bit so I'm able to use the wet and the wet against dry to get a hard edge and the wet into wet to still have soft edges in a moment I'm going to come back and actually look at the shadows in this purple into the, the darks here. Quite strongly into here. this rippled effect. Now that's about as far as I want to go with that at the moment. A little bit more warmth into there. We have to let it dry off then. Because we can't work to the um, shadows underneath these if we don't have it a bit drier to get the slightly harder edges next. I should go probably down a brush size as well. Right, we'll stop at that for the moment, let it dry. Right, the paper's now dry, so we're able to go into the details and I've picked up a number six round, small brush, just to start putting in some of these details of the uh, shadows under the foam. I'm going to, now for that I'm going to want some quite dark purple shades again so I'm going to mix up my purple with a little bit of burnt sienna. So we've got both the warm of the sienna and the cooler purple. So I'm going to mix up some sienna over here, right next to my purple. Let's just try some of that. Now they're going to be shadows underneath here, so I'm going to put it just across the edge of the masking fluid here. Because it's going to be shadow all the way through and around these dark edges. Wherever I've got the masking fluid on this closer edge is going to be cast a shadow by the sun underneath the foam. That's what I'm going to go in now and just pick up all of these with the purple. And it'll be quite sharp edge because I'm working against the masking fluid. Remember this is going to dry lighter than I'm actually doing it, so I'm alright here. Even the top edges at times are going to have a little bit of the, the darker around them. It depends how far away they are from the sand below as to how deep that shadow is. If the water is a little bit deeper, then the shadow is going to be a little bit uh, wider as well.
So wherever these are, I've got to put this shadow in. It takes a little bit of time, but hopefully it's all going to be worthwhile and look great when it's done. And as it goes further back, then it's going to become slightly warmer and the shadow will become more brown. I'm going to go back over this and put in a little bit of the rose into some of these cools, make them a little bit warmer in places. Just to lift them up a bit. That should be about enough. I've had to do a bit of guesswork on this because, of course, until I actually remove this stuff, I can't see if it's too light or too dark or whatever. And uh, But I think I'm almost there. Now, I can take that same very dark colour, that deep um, Prussian blue and purple, and I can start to work on the horse. It's very dark back here. I'll keep it as simple as possible. difficult because really I could do it in a clerk ink on that. I'm going to use a little bit of the cobalt violet, quite opaquely, just there for the helmet, and into that I shall drop a touch of bright red at the edge. Oops, too much, just into the wet. Take that out of there, just because it's leaning downwards, but I can go back in there with the blue. There we go. Just consider a helmet. I'm going to let that dry a bit before I put the other bit on. Just lift out a little bit of this here. So I'll take my wet brush and just lift out a little bit of light on the horse's neck. Just wet that bit of paint I've already done and lift it out a fraction. Look, same on the horse's flank here. We'll just lift a little bit out just to give that little bit of form, a bit of light shining across it. And here there's a bit of yellow that we need, so I'm going to lift out there as well, make it clean again. And when that's dry, I'll drop a little bit of opaque chrome yellow on there. dry enough now to carefully take a little bit of cobalt blue 
and just look at the front of the helmet a fraction just there. Now, about 20 more darks we've got on the waves there, for instance. Actually, I think we're about ready now to um, actually remove a little bit of green down here amongst this lot. Feeling there's a bit more green into there, just a little bit to make the walls warmer. And down here there's shadow around that bit of light. Right, so we must let it dry before we go back. Now whilst that's drying, talking about green, I'm going to take a little bit of uh, mauvey, dark mauvey green and just put in these distant trees here over the top. And this is called a glaze. When I'm putting a colour over another colour and the other one is glowing through and it's changing it, this is a glaze. A glaze is basically a wash but use more carefully. While it's still wet I'll drop in some of the darker bits of tree there. There we are. And then we've got little, little bits of detail coming along the edge of the, the marsh. So now it's dry I can start to play with these little bits of detail and give this feeling of distance. You see how that works. And again, we start to do the same with some of the details here. We're playing with more purer colour now, slightly stronger colour, just to bring out these ripples and little bits of flashes of light colour going on. So burnt sienna I'm using now just to warm up some of these areas of little ripples. Okay, we let that dry again. And then we come back and rub off the uh, Asking for it. The colours have sunk slightly, um, so I'm going to just take my wash brush and give it a little more warmth, cobalt violet, and just give it a give it a wash over with that. So it's got a little bit more warmth going up there. Now the paint's dry, we can do that. You see. Cobalt Violet is just transparent enough to, to be able to do this and it will just bring it back and give it that little bit more colour that I want, a little bit more depth before I take off the masking fluid. So here we go, just a little bit more warmth into this area here, not too much. I've got to let that dry before I can put on the take off the masking fluid. And what I will also do while I'm at that is take the small brush again and just go along that horizon line there, down just a fraction with a little burnt sienna and a little purple, just to darken it down along the along the horizon. So carefully, we'll do a sharper edge right back there. Just let the light show through onto the waves in places. All the way along that horizon line. We don't want it disappearing quite so much as that. And just bring it down into the, the 
same down here but not too much of it just a, a little just to give that edge to the sea and the horizon line. That should do it. I'll take the masking fluid off next then. To remove masking fluid um, you can do it with your fingers like this, but it does tend to smudge a little bit. I've always found it easier to do it with a cloth. It seems to grip the masking fluid better. It's easier on your fingers as well. So we'll take away all this masking fluid now. Now with all the well, there we are with all the masking fluid taken off. And you can see it's brought back a lovely white gleam to it. And most of this we're going to leave. We're just going to touch up some of these little bits of white over here in the surf. But the rest... Um, we should just take down a tone or two, so a little bit of masking fluid left to with your hand. You can take it down, these need to be taken down softer with a mixture of um, the cobalt violet and a little bit of the turquoise. So we've tidied up the horse, now we're going to start working into the surf around the horse and just tickling up carefully with purple greys, the uh, waves around it like this, just gently going in with these little bits of grey, tidying up and making it look a bit more like surf. Give it a little more texture there, rather than being just a straight dry brush work too in places I think would be required. Now for these, so these areas where I said we're going to have to make it just a mixture of some of the turquoise and the mauve. Let's just try a little bit of that, here we go. This sort of colour I think. So the um, a little bit of sparkle in places. We're using the cobalt violet and a little bit of the um, turquoise just to get a cool grey and come over and just get a thin wash, take these brights down just a bit, make them more frothy. You can see we lose that nasty glaring whiteness. And it comes back to being soft, foamy froth. And now you can see we've almost tinted in over these little bits of light, little bits of more details to do. And this painting is actually almost done. I don't do too, too much more. And it hasn't been too big a struggle if we just go at the watercolour step by step because watercolour is basically a battle, as most painting is, and we just have to plan that battle ahead to be able to get everything to happen when it should, and where it should. Now I was talking about on the horse needing a little bit of yellow. Let's see if I can just mix up a bit of heavier paint quite thickly here, so it's more opaque. Just see if I can put that little bit of yellow back into the saddle here. If it's thick enough and opaque enough, it should just stay. There we go. Not quite happy about the head, it seems to have blobbed a bit. So I may use a little bit of gouache just around there to tidy it up. But otherwise I would call that painting about done. I think it looked look nice. What I now was doing was just dragging a few of these little bits of detail across here, doing a few bits of reflections and things as well, just to get the, the feeling of this horse a little better. Even though we're not seeing too much on the actual picture, we want to maybe just do this a bit on here. Just want to kill it. A little bit of feeling of the wet sand, so if we do a few verticals into this, it just gives that a little bit more wetness to it. And with the 
the verticals, of course, we always do a little bit of the horizontals, so we've got some verticals going on, and we'll just drag those across a bit. It's so hot in here, it's drying so fast, I'm having quite a job to even keep the paint wet on my brush, to be honest. There we are. Just need a little more than that. Now, perhaps a signature. Here. Yeah. If we need anything else now, a little darks just here and there, just to pull it together. And at the time we've got to just tidy things up. The fine brush, these last little details we can do. Now, now, I talked about the horse and I wasn't quite happy about him. What I'm going to do is a little trick here. Let's zoom in on that horse. So I'm, so I'm not quite happy with head. And I'm going to take a little bit of white gouache and just tidy it up a fraction. I want that very bright colour there that I simply can't get with these watercolours. So I'm going to go back and use a little touch of pastel in a moment. First of all let me just tidy that head up. It wants to be a fraction. Smack. Now, the, now the tiniest touch of pastel I'm hoping is that if I'm very careful here got a little bit of red there, but if I'm very careful, just using the very corner, I mean we're ever so small on this, of this, I can just put a little bit of very light pastel in here and just give that little bit of pink there that's required look. That's about done it. There we go. Just to tidy it up, now I need to just go back and use the white again. Because I need to just make that a little bit cleaner at the front here. There we are. So we can cheat a little bit if we've got a slight mess. And we can tidy things up. That needs to come into her chest a little more there, that shape. Just want to get the drawing of that better. So she's leaning over there. And while I'm at it, I'll just paint a little bit of her arm in here too, a little bit lighter. Just look at a bit of her arm as well. A little bit of pink into that. So again we can use pastel or gouache just to tidy things up. There we go, I'd call that as near as I'm going to get. Mm -hmm.